So first of all, okay. So first of all, I, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I can see the number of people attending the seminar growing. <laughs> it's <laughs> growing <laughs> mathematically, okay, which is uh, <laughs> so, uh, great news. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a recent work uh, with uh, Pierre Jama at Bayer College in Canada uh, about the asymptotic stability of solitons for the one dimensional uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So, the equation we look at is the following one i dt v minus dx x v minus some uh, nonlinear uh, interaction equal to zero. And I'm looking at it on the line. The initial data is just going to be denoted by this um, And so, what can happen for this uh, equation? So, first, let me uh, remind you that uh, we can get some information for small solutions. So, uh, small solutions, you expect them to have kind of a linear behavior. And so, the linear behavior will, in fact, not be enough to understand a small solution because you have to understand as well uh, what is called long range scattering. And the reason is the following, is that uh, if you just consider uh, the linear Schrodinger equation, that you have i dt d minus dx squared d equal to zero, then uh, you use Fourier analysis to understand uh, the behavior of the solutions. And basically, if you look at on the Fourier side, wave packets which are around some fixed size you here. What they do is that uh, they will travel at speed uh, minus uh, size zero when you go in the physical side. So in order to do this, you use the inverse Fourier transform. And you notice that this wave packet here will be localized at minus size zero t, so it goes to the left. And the solution is uh, very, very small because so uh, this they go to infinity, but in fact, you have dispersion because if this travels at speed minus size zero, then those are wave packets, they travel at different speeds. And in the end, you get that the height of your solution is something like one over the square root of two. So this is for the linear behavior. Wave packet disperse, and the typical size of the solution is one over the square root of two. Now, if you move to small solutions, then you tailor expand your nonlinearity, and you end up with this equation, where you have just the cubic nonlinearity. Okay. For small solutions, you expect this equation to be a good approximation. And unfortunately, B square is of size 1 over T, if you expect some linear behavior. And 1 over T is not integral. So in fact, you cannot approximate the dynamics of small solutions to the cubic NLS by the linear flow. And what happens is that you have to include some a uh, phase correction localized for each wave packet. And the result is the following. It's that <clears throat> if you take an initial data, which is very small, for example, in such space, then uh, you can find some profile function in Fourier such that uh, 
uh, V, instead of being the inverse Fourier transform of the linear evolution, which would just be exponential i psi squared t, you have to add some other correction, which will be of the form uh, minus L over 2. Maybe I'm messing up with the constant here, but it's not a problem. Uh, F hat square log t times F. Okay? So this is, and the remainder is small, so you have to. And so this is called uh, long range scattering because small solutions they are not attracted to the linear flow. They are attracted to a modified linear flow where you have to put some phase correction. Okay, so this is what happens for small solutions. Now, if you increase the size of the solution, the typical nonlinear objects which are expected to happen for such an equation are the solitary groups. So how do you quantify the largeness? How much is larger than the well, so uh, I'm a mathematician, so there exists deltas <laughs> such that <Okay. laughs> you know. It's not the mass of the solitary of the it's what it's not you don't have to be really like very, very small or this is the norm I'm considering. Oh uh, sorry, I didn't put the condition. Okay. This was the okay. Okay. This is I'm small and I'm localized. Okay. Because if I'm just small in energy, I may have some small solitons arising. Mm -hmm. Small solitons, they do not disperse either. So it's important to have this. Uh, okay. Thank you. This is in uh, D for one or in D for one? Oh, sure. Yeah, I wanted to put D equal one in that one. Okay, so it's not. Okay, I'm just on the line. Uh, okay. Let's say, Sean, let's say you can get it to L. You, what the smallness you can give it to L. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, of course, uh, because if you have a solution like this equation, you can scale L back yeah. to one just by uh, some uh, scaling uh, invariance, and then um, okay. <laughs> um, okay, and I forgot to put the references. In fact, there are numerous works of that, so I will uh, put the reference of uh, Hayashi. And uh, now Kim. Then there were works by uh, Gilles Libre as well, by Ozawa. I mean, these were maybe like the first works, but in fact, uh, such line of research continues even uh, nowadays, and there are uh, more recent work, okay. uh, even in the lower regularities, say, in the work of the human and I mean, they don't show that. But it's in their uh, work, this kind of music. Uh, okay, so if you want to have a more nonlinear object, then uh, you may consider solitary waves, which are given for this equation by a theorem which was due to uh, BST Kenyans. Uh, okay, many other thoughts, but this is the one I'm gonna put uh, here is that. Uh, if f has a minimum which has to be a non degenerate uh, and zero, then you can find a branch of solitons. Um, so, for all omega which are between some value zero and omega zero, so there is a you guys such that. Uh, there exists phi omega such that V equal to exponential minus I omega T phi omega of X solves my nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Okay. So this one here is a standing wave. In fact, this solution, what happens with time is that the shape doesn't change. It's still phi omega of x, but the phase change, and the phase is just rotating at a constant speed. Uh, and uh, there were lines of works in the 80s to determine uh, if this 
uh, nonlinear objects were stable or not. And the first notion which appeared was that of orbital stability. And uh, I'm going to cite the work here, which applies well of uh, Krilakis, Chata, and Schwarz, even though there are also works of Kaznav and Jung on both sides. Uh, which says that uh, if I have that the mass along my branch of my solitons is increasing, then uh, phi omega is orbitally stable in the sense that <laughs> if I take <coughs> v0 which is equal to phi omega plus something which is small in say uh, h1 then you can find <coughs> some phase and some position such that V of t is equal to exponential i gamma t pi omega of t, uh, no, sorry, it's just omega plus some small correction u, which remains uniformly bounded. <laughs> Sorry if you cannot really see the board, and I'm gonna say that again. Just uh, so if you so you have this nonlinear object, which are standing wave. Yeah. Phi omega is h one of the right. Yes. So uh, phi omega is like uh, decaying exponentially fast at infinity. So no problem of integrability, and of course uh, it's a very small subject. Um. Okay. And so. Uh, what happens is that if you start close to such nonlinear objects, then you will remain close to one of them because there are many such standing waves. If you change their phase, it remains a solution of the equation. If you change their location, it remains a solution. And so you don't know to which one of the members of the family you are close, but you know that you remain close to the family four times. And you don't know what Q uh, does for large objects. Okay. <laughs> and we know some uh, property about this by omega, omega is something for zero or Yes, you, you can, uh, uh, since it's a one T equation, it goes back to a, a one dimensional OTE. Mm -hmm. And well, you can do explicit computations. And if we go to this limit where omega zero, there's some similarity or to, to continue a branch way. Uh -huh. uh, good question, actually. Uh, I, I think that you know you have these branches that become maybe unstable or things like that. So here, okay, at omega zero, it actually depends, uh, I guess, on the nonlinearity that you are putting. Close to zero, I guess, it's universal. You can write down the explicit things. It just goes back to the cubic NLS somehow if you have the cubic expansion. But uh, okay, at omega zero, it depends on the nonlinearity. The minimum at zero or f is to to get that uh, omega to zero to the numerator of the dimension of f. So this is uh, uh, the position. Yeah, I mean it's somehow like you have to. I mean, I, imagine that it's uh, a cubic term. Then depending on the sign close to zero, you either get like the defocusing cubic NLS or the focusing cubic NLS. One has smooth solidons and the other doesn't. So. so for uh, for the for the stability function, the, if you take the value of that omega, or I mean the first one, the, the derivative, yes, it gives you the omega. It's a it's a condition of omega. And it's yes, it's a it's a condition on the on this branch. So this is a function. The mass of the solitons is a function of omega. Yeah, yeah. And I differentiate it with respect to omega. Yes. And if it's increasing. Uh, for for one omega or for all omega. Well, I mean, if it's increasing oh. near one, it's okay. This is a local uh, 
Oh, I'll, I'll give it. I mean, the, the, the omega fit is fixed in the in the, the theory. I mean, in this yeah. theory, when you uh, when you satisfy this omega means one point of omega or uh, all the set of omega from zero to omega zero. So to have the orbital stability of phi omega in the branch, you only need to have this condition near omega. For the other values of omega, you don't care. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. I mean, and if it holds at omega, it holds for nearby omega. So you have a branch on which the mass is strictly increasing. Okay. Uh, one more question about this yt. So yt means a spreading order. So yt is a position. Uh, so it's minus yt or yes, it's phi right? omega of x minus yt. Oh, sorry, minus. Okay. Yes, so it's the position. So it's, of, a, it's uh, yeah. like a So the, I mean, the wave is traveling, which is a, yeah. Yeah, so it's a solitary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so don't hesitate if you have a further question. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if, if we can translate this in terms of air quality. So this uh, uh, is monotony is your omega square. Uh, no, sufficient condition at least to say that towards. Uh, In fact, uh, the only. Uh, I mean, of course, so you can do some uh, perturbative analysis if you know a Taylor expansion of f, for example. So if f looks like a focusing cubic NLS then uh, you will have such uh, results. But then after, it really depends on some conditions for F. And for most models that I know, uh, it's checked uh, by hand, uh, non-linearity per non-linearity. If you want to have the information on the whole range. Of course, if you take F and you know it's Taylor expansion near zero, then you will have such monotonicity close to zero just as a consequence of the solitons for the monomial stranger equation, which are X. Uh, okay, not uh, explicitly. Uh, okay. So, uh, now. Uh, about uh, the stability or the gamma, the function of the and why it's in front of the stability, right? Well, I mean, so just, uh, well, you, you know, they, they, they exist uh, somehow. Uh, and then you I mean, see like how they depend on uh, the zero with the effect of energy zero go back to zero those two corrections you appear right? yeah well I mean okay you you I'm pretty sure you can say that they are continuous at each time t they are continuously depending continuously on the u zero and things like that so is it something like a uh, omega t or, or, or w or omega t plus something small this gamma yeah. t uh, yes yeah. this you can say uh, but in fact uh, not really uh, okay because uh, imagine that uh, you pick another member of the branch so you start with omega phi omega prime yeah then in fact your true phase is exponential i uh, minus omega prime t. So gamma t will diverge very far away from uh, just omega t. So, so it's not omega t plus something which is small. So like the derivative in time is small. You mean that there's a, uh, again a logarithm correction? Like no, it can be uh, even stronger. It can even be stronger. like, uh, it can be oh. a linear correction. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, so really, I want to stress here it's the same. You start at omega and you remain close to phi omega. So the thing is that uh, maybe you are phi omega prime, and such a theorem does not detect that. Maybe u does not converge to zero at all here, you know? Maybe just u is small. Uh, okay. And so uh, our uh, aim with uh, Michael Barita is to actually find that uh, this uh, solitary waves, they are uh, asymptotically stable in the sense that if you start nearby, then you will converge eventually as time goes to plus infinity back to a solitary wave, which may have other parameters as I just discussed, okay? 
Uh, and for that, uh, the first thing you would like to do is just you linearize your equation, right? If you want to know more about stability. And <coughs> Uh, here are the spectral properties of uh, the linearized operator. So if you linearize your equation, then you will get that uh, you end up with such equation, i dt u minus dx u, and here you will have uh, two potentials. And you will have uh, plus omega u. So this is the linearized equation. And uh, since you have a complex equation, the problem is that uh, this linearized equation is complex. Um, so it's easier to handle it with an operator, which is uh, not does not involve like complex communication. So to do that, you can just uh, complexify uh, somehow. I mean, it's not complexified. And I just introduce a vector, which is uh, u and u bar. And then this vector solves this equation, i t t uh, u uh, plus h omega u equals zero, and h is a matrix uh, Schrodinger operator. term by uh, just some convention. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and so, okay, you have to do a spectral theory for vector uh, operators of this form. And what you can prove is that, in fact, uh, if you look at the spectrum, the essential spectrum is that of this part here, because this is a compact perturbation, so you can apply a cattle perturbation theory for operators. And so you get that somehow for the essential spectrum, you are just seeing this. And the essential operate the essential spectrum then will become this. Now what else do you have? The thing is that you have many invariances for your equation, uh, which are due to uh, change of position, change of phase, Galilei transformation, and um, also you can change like omega in the branch. And so you will have the full family of uh, solitary waves. which will be solutions of this form, exponential i e x minus uh, plus p square t minus gamma minus omega t phi omega at x plus 2 p t minus y. Okay. So it's a four parameter family of solutions. And I am changing here. Uh, so this is the Galilei transformation that you are seeing here. It changes the phase of the solution, then it changes also the position, etc. And this is why you get traveling waves out of just a standing wave that you had here. Okay. This thing here, it just travels. Uh, and they are exponentially localized. They really look like bumps, and they travel uh, with a speed here, which is uh, minus two. Okay. So, if you have 
a whole family of nonlinear solutions, then of course this brings obstacles to your asymptotic stability because you could just start by being a nearby solitary wave. And for the linearized operator, when you have symmetries for your location, it always produces uh, eigenvalues for the corresponding linearized operator. And here, the, these eigenvalues, they are all here at zero. And at zero, you have at least in your generalized kernel, these persons, which are uh, phi omega, uh, i x phi omega, d x phi omega, and d omega phi omega. Okay. So this is what you can know a priori, the essential spectrum, and that you have that symmetries will generate many uh, eigenvalues. I mean, just one eigenvalue, zero, but with uh, many uh, eigenfunctions, yeah. Uh, if you have the Grudakis uh, Shatter Strauss uh, condition, and, and if you work a little bit, uh, you can see that uh, all the other parts of the spectrum are discrete and our eigenvalues of finite multiplicity. And uh, with this condition, they can only be localized between minus omega and omega. So when you have this, there's a strong restriction. The eigenvalues, they can only appear here. And uh, if they appear here, it's an obstacle to uh, linear stability. Because if you have an eigenvalue here, it will just make some oscillatory mode in the, for the linearized equation, which will not decay to zero. Then it's a whole other thing. Uh, so this is the assumption that we will not make. And I'm going to assume that this uh, spectral assumption holds. <laughs> so we assume uh, the Grilakis Shatter Strauss condition. And that uh, the only eigenfunctions are that corresponding to the symmetries. <clears throat> and finally, there are something very specific which can happen here at uh, the limit of the essential spectrum. Maybe you can have some uh, edge resonance. I'm going to not enter into details, but this is another assumption that we have to make, which are natural obstacles for uh, linear decay. And under these assumptions, uh, the theorem, as you see myself and Pierre Jarin. Uh, so you start with a solution which is some soliton. And then you add something else with U0 that is small with the same norm in which uh, I was quantifying smallness for the uh, device scattering. And then the solution is global. And you can describe precisely its asymptotic behavior. So you have uh, that 
you resemble the traveling wave, precisely this thing here. This remainder, it will disperse. So it goes to zero in some sense. For example, if you measure it in L infinity, it has the same decay that I was mentioning at the very beginning for the linear equation. So it's like one over square root of t. So this goes to zero and you are only seeing this guy. And the parameters of this function, they converge to the asymptotic parameters uh, to the parameters of a member of the family. And so you will have that, for example, uh, omega converges to some omega infinity, that gamma is equal to omega infinity t plus some gamma infinity plus little o of one, etc. For the other parameters, you have the same asymptotic convergence as t goes to infinity. So you have these solitary waves. I perturb them a little bit, and then I will converge back to a stationary, to a traveling wave, which may not be the exact same one. Maybe between the initial parameters, so here I have to state uh, the result so easily. I had just uh, omega zero, no p, no gamma, uh, no y. So maybe I will start to move we start to have some phase, etc. Yeah. Uh, in the neighborhood of omega zero, or you just let the flow symmetry rates? Ah, uh, sorry. So omega zero maybe is a bad notation because it was the uh, last uh, uh, extremity of the uh, interval on which I had my uh, drawing wave. Uh, but here, omega zero can be uh, any uh, on my branch of uh, orbitally stable traveling wave. I am asymptotically stable. You converge to the same. No, 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 no. no I have okay. omega zero, and here I have omega infinity. Right. So, uh, okay. Omega zero. But uh, okay, it's a, it's a good question what you may ask. So, as a byproduct, uh, okay. So I just want to say one thing more is that um, I mentioned that uh, there was modified scattering for small solutions. So here we can prove that this remainder undergoes uh, modified scattering. So, in addition, u of t is equal to the same formula that I was mentioning for uh, modified scattering. So chi square t minus L over two F hat square log T F hat plus something which is small in L2 and converges to zero. So I have modified scattering. And finally, uh, you may wonder how all this depends on the initial data. And okay, I'm not going to write it down to uh, save time, but uh, the map which to u0 associates uh, omega infinity, gamma infinity, p infinity, y infinity, and this f hat is continuous from this space to the space where. Okay. So, yeah. Are there any? Clean examples to make sure that all these sort of stability assumptions hold. Oh, good question. <laughs> good question. In fact, uh, this we expect these uh, conditions to be uh, uh, somewhat stable, and so we believe that there are uh, numerous uh, examples, but there are also numerous examples uh, where this does not hold true, actually. And so uh, one that I know for sure, but then you have to do, uh, I mean, uh, linear, uh, linear analysis is that you can take this function to be uh, the focusing cubic NLS minus some printed correction. If you take that, Uh, as a nonlinearity, like a difference between cubic and quintic, uh, then this is true. And our theorem applies. Yeah. So it's not an empty theorem. <laughs> <laughs>
it's not. <laughs> uh, okay, so in fact, uh, many people have worked uh, on these tools. Um, and uh, maybe the work I want to re-decide is the one of uh, Buslife and Perelman. Uh, and uh, I mean, they were able to obtain such uh, stability, uh, synthetic stability, but uh, the interaction and linearity had to vanish a lot near the origin. So somehow this had to be like V to the power nine. Okay. Then there were uh, other works, for example. Uh, this life uh, with Sunem, three, where they can treat some uh, important bots. Then there is uh, another important work due to Krieger and Schlag. Uh, where they can treat uh, this uh, nonlinearity. And okay, it's the uh, explicit nonlinear change equation. You have instable modes, but the instable modes, it's not such a problem. So you have conditional asymptotic stability. Up to finally tuning your initial data, you are still asymptotically stable. Otherwise, uh, then the, uh, uh, your uh, other modes, they will uh, take the control. Uh, okay, and so you see that somehow like the nonlinearity power is decreasing, decreasing. Uh, and so uh, our work is the first uh, where we don't have any condition on F. Okay, so F can be cubic. And really it's because, um, so the main difficulty, because uh, the, the proof is quite technical, but the main difficulty that I was mentioning is that your linear decay in one dimension is very small. Your solution, it converges to zero if it's in a neighborhood of your soliton but very slowly with time. And so your nonlinear effects, they might be very big depending on the size of the nonlinearity. Uh, and at many points in the proof, it can be problematic, including for uh, handling long range schedule. And so here you can see that the uh, order of the nonlinearity at the origin is decreasing. And then you had uh, many other works uh, supported using integrability techniques, for example, you have some work of like Kenya Pinsowski. And then uh, you also have uh, some work that I wanted to mention uh, by uh, Pierre Germain, uh, Nader Nassimudi, and uh, Jalal Chata, uh, which is uh, not uh, concerning the 1D NLS, but where they develop a concept of uh, space time resonances which is going to be useful for our proof. And uh, in similar lines of work, there are works by uh, Germain, Puzateri, for small solitons arising from an exterior potential, you have work by uh, Mizumashi, by Gong Chen uh, recently. Um, okay, so there are a lot of uh, literature out there, and this is, uh, say, only for uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but you have also other models like Clyde Gordon. Uh, okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk a bit about the proof. Uh, so, how much time exactly do I have? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so uh, do, do you have the questions for the main theorem or not? So essentially, you don't have uh, the assumption of the linearity just because you moved uh, everything on the spectral assumption. Uh, is, uh, not really, because uh, there are here and there are some, I'm not thinking about that, but they, uh, they, also, have, they also have uh, spectral assumptions. I mean, uh, for example, if you work with that, then you don't have the, the edge uh, resonance, and you just have some uh, instable modes, which we can also handle via our techniques. So it's not really that. Um, I mean, there are assumptions there as well. So, so when you said that the eigenfunctions 
article, for example, is in place, but you mentioned the yes. picture. Uh, yes. It's only that you have the agate value. Zero. Yes. Okay. And that zero is. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, what was our question? Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit to the uh, Um, so, Sean, uh, yeah, on when you say five omega zero, so the omega zero is the one at the edge of the branch. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not uh, okay. just, just the, it's one in the branch. You pick any soliton in the branch if you are close enough to it, then you will converge to another soliton in the branch. Yeah, we don't know how far it is from the initial one. No, no, I know because, uh, uh, but I just said it um, because I didn't okay. want to write it, but. I have the continuity of uh, the map which to the initial data associates with this. Yeah. Uh, we did not like uh, try to go too far. Actually, it's a funny thing is that uh, due to the presence of the soliton, uh, we are sure that, okay, you cannot get any F hat here. So somehow you cannot say that you take any modified scattering solution of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and that you superpose it to a soliton. It's false. Because this f hat has to vanish at the frequencies which travel at the same speed as the soliton. So there are some hidden thing here, uh, which, and I think it's an interesting topic to try to study more of this map. And actually, like this, uh, how they call it, like the uh, asymptotic completeness map for the schedule. Uh, okay. So I'm going to leave uh, this here and <laughs> a bit to talk about the book. So uh, in the proof, the thing is that uh, you have to uh, do everything at the same time. Like if you start near a certain time, you don't know that you are converging to one at plus infinity. So you have to determine this. And this, we do it uh, via a bus hop. And so uh, we use this uh, definition. So we don't really use the approach of the uh, figure and slang uh, where they use like pass. We rather use some continuous induction arguments. Mm -hmm. And we say that uh, the solution is trapped. Towards a member of the family. And some intervals in the uh, If you can write your solution in this form. So V of T is exponential I omega t plus p x phi omega plus u plus x minus y t. So everything here on the t. So we say that we are trapped towards some member of the solid uh, the family of solitons. If at any time, I can write it as a soliton, plus something which is small, and such that these <laughs> parameters, they will converge to the asymptotic values. Uh, and so we will ask that omega minus omega bar is small, like uh, t to the power uh, so minus u, and similarly that p minus p bar is small. Nu is like some fixed uh, positive constant. Okay, so I don't know what the soliton at plus infinity is, but I say that 
on some interval zero capital T, there was at least one soliton to which I was almost converging. I'm almost converging to it because maybe at time capital T, omega is not equal to omega bar, but they are, they are not far away from uh, another. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then I want to add some smallness on you because I need to propagate uh, some smallness. And here is uh, where uh, the problem becomes a bit technical, is that uh, I want to say that U disperses like a linear wave. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know a linear wave around which, okay. So I don't know around which member of the family to linearize. Because at time T, I am close to this soliton, but at time capital T, I am rather close to another soliton for which the parameter have changed. Of course, if everything was decreasing very, very fast, this difference would not be meaningful. But since things are decreasing very, very slowly, since omega is converging to the asymptotic value only very, very slowly, then in fact, it changes a lot. Maybe the soliton at time t is very far away from the soliton at cap time capital T. And so I need to use two And so I am saying that U is equal to the projection, so capital U, is equal to the projection onto the essential spectrum of the operator H omega of capital U. So uh, this is equivalent to asking orthogonality conditions uh, for U. And so this means that uh, this soliton here is the closest soliton. But I will linearize not to the asymptotic soliton at uh, time capital T, but halfway to it, in fact. And I will write V in another form, which will be exponential I gamma T of this. This one here, I will take uh, its momentum to be equal to the asymptotic momentum. And I will call this U bar. And I will say that this U bar resembles a linearized wave around my asymptotic series. So I will say that U bar is equal to exponential i t h, but here h is at omega bar, by a sample of value uh, of some profile function that I call f. And so the reason for that, uh, so, and I will ask, in order to say that U bar is almost a scattering solution, I will ask uh, some bounds, not on the physical side, but some bounds on the Fourier side. And so I will ask that F is small uh, in the weighted space, and that F if I measure it in H1, remember we should expect modified scattering. So this has to grow, and I will let it grow a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, here I will do the drawing of uh, the strategy is that you have your family of uh, traveling waves. So these are like the I just take one parameter and this is like the set five omega. And I am not exactly equal to one of them. I am equal to something here. And V, what I can do is that at time T, I can decompose it in an orthogonal way to the branch of 
stationary solutions. Thank you, I'm sorry, wait. And this will give me u of t. And my parameters here will be omega of t. But this omega of t, in fact, will converge very, very slowly to some asymptotic value, which will be omega bar. And uh, I will not say that u resembles the solution linearized at omega of t, but I will say that u resembles the solution linearized at omega bar, okay? So I need somehow two decompositions. One to handle the interaction between the radiation and the solitary wave, and another decomposition to handle the long time dynamics of my uh, radiation. This I see this Okay. And so this says that on a fixed interval zero to capital T, my solution is converging almost to some asymptotic solitary wave, and my radiation U is resembling almost a linearized solution around the final parameter. This is valid on zero capital T. And I know that for capital T very small, it should be true just by continuity argument and smallness. And the thing is that we use a bootstrap procedure. If this is true on zero capital T, then we show in fact such decomposition is true on zero capital T plus one, on zero capital T plus two, etc. And in the end, we show this decomposition is true on zero to infinity. So the heart of the proof, is to prove the following, is that if u is trapped towards exponential i p bar x phi omega bar on zero t, then there exists a longer time interval. There exist other parameters, omega bar prime and p bar prime, such that u is trapped throughout Exponential i p bar prime x phi mega bar prime on zero t plus delta. Okay. Because once you have proved this proposition, then in then you can use some continuous induction argument. But is this the identity of t or yes? Uh, it's very important. So the other thing is capability which then is zero and two. Yes, so yes, 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 of course. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. 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 It is. <laughs> but okay, I'm not writing the proof. I mean, you, you see the idea. <laughs> and so uh, as a corollary, uh, U is trapped. Around some asymptotic solitant on zero 
infinity. Okay. So the idea is that, is that if you can prove it's trapped on some intervals, trapped on the larger interval and the larger interval, etc. And so, uh, yeah, once you've converged to omega bar, then you can prove that you converge to the bar. Yeah. In the end, you will reach the last one. No, uh, because this is part of this uh, assumption that as long as you have that, this implies decay. Oh, okay. In fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's part of this assumption. So the power there is uh, how large is it? Oh, new? Oh, no, no, it's new. <laughs> new. But and in fact, it? new is super small. I mean, uh, yeah. super small, super small. Yeah, yeah. But then, how can you really it use that it converges? Like, uh, well, uh, I, mean, um, okay, okay. I mean, even if it's super small, uh, this goes to zero. What? Okay, so what was I saying? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. In fact, I was making a mistake. Okay, for this parameter, I asked the minus one. Minus one is strong. Yeah, 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 you're right. It's uh, then it's the position and the phase which converge with the uh, okay, and so uh, I mean, the thing is that uh, at what time did I start? Can I have like a few minutes more? Or yeah, what? Uh, and so, okay, so I just wanted to mention uh, one thing, in fact. Uh, it's that uh, I was saying that we were using uh, space time resonances uh, as uh, Nader has worked uh, on this issue uh, in the past. And I wanted to illustrate just one way in which we use uh, these spectral assumptions. That's, um, so your evolution equation looks like this. You have some nonlinear terms, and you have some terms which are called the modulation terms, which depend on the time variation of your parameter. So this is schematically how your equation looks like. And so this equation, you use it to determine two things. Sorry, we didn't have to twelve. Ah, okay. Well, sorry. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> so this ends. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna take uh, thirty seconds to end my talk. Um, so you use this equation in two ways. One is to determine these parameters. The other one is to determine how you decay. And in fact, when you choose your parameters here, maybe you choose them well via the orthogonality condition, which minimizes the influence on you in them. But then the thing is that this transformation maybe is very incompatible with uh, the linear filtering that we were doing when we said that U was resembling the solution of the linearized equation. <clears throat> When you do that, it's very sensitive to changes in the parameters. And so you have to optimize two things. On the one hand, you want to choose this decomposition to minimize the effect of these parameters here, but you also want it to be time almost independent to allow for proving dispersive estimates on capital U. And so this was why we had to use two distinct uh, decompositions. 
and I don't have time to talk about space time personal uses. So <laughs> okay, thank you. We don't even have time for questions. Yeah.